exciting research program. After 14 years of painstaking work, it is now making significant progress. The goal is to develop a system for achieving voice and eventually visual contact with persons who have departed their physical bodies, but are still very much alive in what St. Paul, 2,000 years ago, termed the spiritual body. The work began in 1971 in a small laboratory in Philadelphia, where engineers George Meek, Paul Jones, and Hans Heckman built their first very special radio-like device. It failed, just as did all the experimental devices built for this purpose by three of our great inventors, Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, and Guglielmo Marconi. Fortunately, however, Meek and Jones found telepathic means for verbal communication with scientists alive on the other side of the veil. A 62-year-old man, an advertising executive possessed of reliable psychic abilities, provided contact with such scientists who could tell about their current living conditions. They could also give technical advice for further developments. Dr. William Francis Gray Swan, a distinguished British-American scientist who had died just nine years earlier, was communicating with us frequently. Thereupon, one of Dr. Swan's lifelong friends, still in the flesh, was impressed to join our research team. This psychic contact with Dr. Swan and his fellow scientists in the spirit realms resulted in construction of a second, more sophisticated device for interplane communication. Inside the silver-plated lining of this elliptical copper chamber was a very delicate microwave sending and receiving system. The system was so sensitive, it detected the static electricity caused by truck tires on a street 150 feet outside the building at four o'clock in the morning. Although only sporadic pulsed signals from Dr. Swan and his team of mathematicians, chemists, and physicists could be detected, much valuable information was obtained. Pushing still higher into the electromagnetic spectrum and utilizing newly available equipment in the gigahertz range, this third system was built and experimented with for two years. It was great for detecting a low-flying mosquito at 50 feet. Meek, Jones, and Heckman adopted Thomas Edison's philosophy and said, well, at least we know three ideas which will not work. So let's push on and find one that will work. Meanwhile, in 1974, an additional lab had been established by Meek under the direction of William O'Neill, a creative electronic technician. Bill himself, with superb psychic ability, could clairvoyantly see and clairaudiently talk to the invisible spirits with whom he desired to make instrumental contact. In 1977, Bill achieved his first actual voice exchange with a man who said he had been a medical doctor and a ham radio operator who had died in Ohio five years previously. The voice connection, while audible, was filled with tremendous static and lost within days. But at this time, O'Neill's fortunes turned, and he saw and talked psychically with a man who announced that he was Dr. George Jeffries Mueller, an American scientist who had died in 1967. Mueller, obliged by giving his social security number, a small town in California where a copy of his death certificate was filed, details of academic and professional careers, all of which Meek was able to verify, including social security payments to two surviving wives. In the next few years, Bill and Dr. Mueller had hours of two-way conversations, again psychically, while discussing how to solve the many technical problems of instrumental communication. Mueller drew on his lifelong hobby of the theory of music to suggest adding a mixture of 13 audio tones from 121 cycles per second to 701 cycles per second. This suggestion 
and other refinements contributed by both O'Neill and Mueller resulted in an historical breakthrough. The first really successful two-way voice contact between the two worlds. Here is just one minute of the exchange, which totaled more than 20 hours before the contact was broken in November of 1981. systems, the telegraph, telephone, wireless radio, and television had each shown that in the 10 to 30 years after the initial success, other inventors picked up and made the many innovations so that the systems were of practical use. Thus, to seek out and to enlist the services of such inventors, Meek made a trip around the world, and in April of 1981, he held a conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. As a result of this worldwide publicity, Meek took two further scouting trips, each through seven countries in Europe and the British Isles, and three trips across the USA. Since 10 years of open-minded search had shown that, in some unknown way, psychic energy seemed to be a necessary addition to the electronic equipment, he now rallied electronic specialists who were also psychics. Then he organized and established the nonprofit Life Beyond Death Research Foundation Incorporated to solicit funds to permit the expansion of the research. I also made a trip in mid-1983 to meet these new researchers whom I would like to now introduce to you. First is Aaron Stankowski, Professor of Electrical Engineering and Physics at Bingen Technical Institute in Mainz, West Germany. Dr. Stankowski has his own laboratory for receiving voices in English and in German. These voices actually discuss his project and assist him in his research. As is Meek, he is excited when good results are obtained by other researchers and spends many hours analyzing their tape recordings. Dr. Sienkowski heads a project to build a scientifically acceptable theoretical floor under our work. He brings us into contact with other German research notables. Here, he talks to Hans Otto Koenig, who is, as of now, another LBD associate. 
Hans is a self-employed ultrasonics engineering consultant. He gets important help from his spirit guide, Helmut. Walter Steinugel was a mathematician who worked with Koenig prior to his sudden death in 1983. Imagine Koenig's surprise when 15 minutes after Steinugel's passing in a local hospital, Steinugel reported his death to Koenig using their system. They continued their two worlds collaboration and now have what is currently the clearest and best tonal quality so far achieved for recognition of an individual voice. Here is Steinugel's voice as it was recently heard in Koenig's lab. We have repeated the voice three times for your careful listening. I now present to you Dr. Sienkowski's analysis. Shortly after his death, Koenig was able to receive the paranormal voice with the name Walter Steinökel and we are able now to compare the two voices. to sustain contacts beyond just phrases and broken sentences. His goals suit his quite warm nature and his sensitive concern for other people. Another of LBD's German collaborators is Manfred Kaga, truly a Renaissance man. In his 40-room castle, 30 rooms are occupied by what may be the largest privately owned photographic lab in the world. Here, he is seated at his personal electron scanning microscope where he invented color microscopy and takes color photos of microscopic sea animals such as this. His work in Curlian photography is seen in this photograph. Here, he combines an x-ray with Curlian photography. Kaga is eager to collaborate with us on spirit photography as soon as LBD can provide funding for a portion of the projected research. Will Thorner, who lives on the English Channel, south of London, is another valued LBD researcher. Highly psychic since birth, his career involved electrical engineering, osteopathic and homeopathic medicine. Will has spent 15 years in creating the technology to determine the response of both animate and inanimate matter to human thought. A highly sensitive cell 
in this equipment has been remotely triggered in his lab by his mind when he was as far away as Ireland. This may be the first piece of paranormal engineering with repeatable and comprehensible results. Will Thorner's pioneering research into energies of the thought process play a valuable role in our understanding of the process of communication with the spirit worlds? You met our LBD colleague Hans Heckman earlier in our reference to opening the lab in 1971. Hans is still using his many electromechanical skills in collaboration with psychic engineer Gene Catter of Portland, Oregon. With help from Nikola Tesla coming through the mind of Gene Catter, they are pioneering a line quite distinct from any other LBD researchers. In part, this involves a very special disc antenna on the face of which Hans Heckman has just painstakingly wound 82,000 feet of one inch plastic and metallicized glass ribbon. Erland Babcock, yet another one of our psychic electronic colleagues, is the manager of the audiovisual laboratory of Lowell University in Massachusetts. Earl Badcock's skills in the use of sound and audio equipment expand our group's expertise, but his main thrust is to use light instead of electricity in a communication system, which he is building under grant from LBD. I am responsible for being certain that all of the information generated by these colleagues is passed around to suitable critics. We have a lot more critics on our staff than problem solvers, but isn't that true for everybody? Although I too am a critic, I also have my problem solving work. I'm a member of the Electrical Engineering Honor Society and the Scientific Research Society. As is the case with the other investigators which George Meek has assembled, I have a guide, Daryl, and a team of assistants who help me on problem solving on their side of the veil. And I welcome all the help I can get. This shows the flame transducer experiments in LBD's own laboratory. Inside each white box is a flame. When the flame is this size, we can use it as a speaker, such as in your stereo. Only better. We can create the sound quality of a full set of woofers, tweeters, and the rest, just as with the plasma in this flame. Our goal is to carry this research to the point of having a spirit in the room use it as a microphone and make his or her voice audible. Incidentally, this work may said to have been started by Lord Rayleigh in his book, The Theory of Sound, published 105 years ago. This is our LBD laser and living tissue test equipment. I am trying to use light and living things to produce the support system to lengthen the contacts our researchers are achieving. This test equipment may have considerable use in all phases of our international research. This compact laser system will eventually be developed as a portable model. Both of these prototypes are so sensitive that I can detect a footstep at a range of 100 feet. Sometimes I have to work in the dark, late at night, to reduce background interference, even though our lab is located in a rural area at an elevation of 2,200 feet in the mountains. Concluding this audiovisual report, I should mention that our work is greatly facilitated by George Meek's many years of effort to map the territory of inner space. He has given our researchers and the world a firm conceptual basis for understanding the statement of Jesus 2,000 years ago. In my father's house, there are many mansions. George's work combined with the scientific studies of worlds within worlds, 
edited up by Dr. Senkowski, as mentioned earlier, will result in a theoretical framework by which science can begin to comprehend the basis of operation for man's next great communication system. In the last 75 years, dozens of dwellers on the spirit planes have predicted that such a communication system would be perfected in the closing years of this century. Hence, for all the reasons outlined in the LBD brochure, we invite you to participate personally in this momentous effort to launch mankind into the very real worlds of spirit and provide the coming generations with a far more worthwhile civilization. We feel that our present concentration on certain wavelengths of light may well prove to be symbolic of the rainbow's promise for a brighter tomorrow.